Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series, Reflections in Time, was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgie more than 20 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960, and I served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgie in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to, than to continue this work. Here we are in a lovely afternoon in the spring of the year 2001, and I have as my guest uh, Professor Roger Hoberg. And uh, Roger is uh, Associate Professor of Chemistry, and for many, many years, was the chairman of the chemistry department. Roger, welcome. We're glad to have you here Thank today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, well, uh, we've got lots of things to talk about, I'm sure, because we've known each other for a good many years. But one thing that I don't think we've ever uh, discussed is your background, your roots. Where did you come from? And uh, Well, I was born in a little town about the size of this studio <laughs> in Atkinson, named Atkinson, Illinois. Uh, my mother was a housemaker, and my father owned a small fleet of trucks, and it was a wonderful town to grow up in. Uh, if I remember the sign on the way into town when I was in grade school, it was 900 people. Wow. I had uh, 23 in my graduating class, uh, and went to a little grade school that never had more, I never had more than three kids in my grade school class mm -hmm. at any one time. All, all nine years. I actually was able to go to kindergarten wow. at that time. So um, it was a coal mining town on one side of the street and a farming community on the other side of the street. Uh, Main Street literally divided the town <laughs> into the coal mines and the farms. But uh, very interesting place. I was a uh, well, sounds up like a, a good place to grow yeah, up. Yeah, in a small town you can do yeah. things. You know yeah. that you could never, if I had grown up in Omaha you know, I played basketball and I played football. I would never have been able to do those sorts of things. So, so there's something to be said for small towns. The other yeah. thing that, of course, is that people know your business before before yeah. you even know it. With 23 people in the graduating class. How did you have enough people to play football? We, uh, well, you know, until I was a freshman, we played uh, eight-man football. Oh, okay. No, I'm sorry, six-man, six-man, six-man six yeah. man, six man football. That's my still quite popular in some parts of Nebraska. Small towns, yes, yeah. right. We went to 11-man. As a six-man team, we were a powerhouse. As an 11-man <laughs> team, we, we, we got trounced by everybody. <laughs> you didn't have a uh, two-platoon uh, system. No, because we never <laughs> had, I don't think we ever had 22 out for football. So, <laughs> so it, was a, it was a pretty thin, pretty thin program, but fun. So you graduated from high school then? Yes, and, uh, I graduated from high school in 1957 and started college at Northern Illinois University in uh, 1958, in, in, in January of 58. I, uh, How did you pick Northern Illinois? Well, my older brother went to Western. Mm -hmm. In the Illinois system, there's Western, Eastern, uh, Southern, Northern, and Illinois Normal at, uh, at Normal. And I didn't want to go to Western because that's where Bob had gone to school, so I went to Northern. I'll have to tell you, as this goes along, many of the more important decisions in my life have been made on pretty thin, <laughs> pretty <laughs> well, I, I think that's substances. True of, true of all of us. Yeah, and I went to college, literally, if you look at my high school annual, to be a high school basketball coach. That's what I was going to do. And when I uh, got to Northern and I had to fill out my major, I marked chemistry. I have no, this day have, I mean, it's not completely out of the blue because I always had a chemistry set, a chemistry laboratory in my mother's basement and I always was playing with the Gilbert chemistry sets of the, of the 50s and things like that. But until that moment, 
chemistry was not what Did I had planned to do. you a chemistry course in high school? Oh yes, yes, mm -hmm. oh yes. We had a, I had a, I was taught by the biology teacher, mm -hmm. of course, but, uh, but um, a fun course. And we they had a lab? And oh yes, yeah, we mm -hmm. had a lab. Yeah, we made uh, etched glass and all. That's the one I remember the most. We made <laughs> hydrogen fluoride paste and etched glass. I uh -huh. still have the slide that I etched if I can find it someplace, but uh, it was, so there, there I was at Northern, uh, a, a chemistry major. <laughs> <laughs> and you stuck with it? Yes, yes I did. Um, I was, again, Northern at that time was just coming out of the era when it was a um, teacher's college mm -hmm. and it was now a university, uh, but I still was planning on being a high school chemistry teacher. I finished my major, had to do student teaching, student taught for one semester in a high school in uh, Rochelle, Illinois, was given a study hall with about a hundred freshman girls in it. Went home that night and started filling out applications for graduate school. <laughs> and this was the time of Sputnik and yeah. everybody was going to graduate school and my brother had just entered graduate, a graduate program in mathematics and it was the thing to do. So, and my, uh, somebody suggested that I come to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, so I did. <laughs> no, nothing other than a suggestion. I applied, they accepted me and my wife and I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska in the Summer of '62. That was right after you graduated. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I went four years to undergraduate school. And then right into right, right into graduate school. Four years in graduate school, and here I was at OU. Well, you did better than I did sticking out a four-year program in chemistry. I started out as a chemist too, and uh, uh, <laughs> lasted one year. Well, <laughs> organic chemistry does take its toll from time to time. <laughs> um, then. Uh, so you uh, you worked at uh, you were at uh, at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln from 19 uh, up until 1967 when you graduated. Well, but no, you actually, uh, but you came here before yeah, that. Yeah, I came here in '66. I um, I one you know graduate school can have its odds, twists and turns. And in oh, about March of '66, I guess that would have been my advisor and I agreed that I was probably done and could start writing my thesis and could start looking for a job. Mm -hmm. So I did. Well, one at, one at some point along the line, about the 1st of May, as I remember, all my data turned out to be bad. <laughs> and so I had no choice but to re-establish all my data. Uh, so I took data for 12 hours a day <laughs> until the day, until the day you know, you, OU said I had to be here. And, and so it I was OU here. back then, right? Oh, yes. University, yeah. Omaha, Municipal you, University of Omaha. It sure was, okay. yes. Uh, so a wonderful time to join the university. I mean, we were at a, a crossroads, as you know, mm -hmm. about the changes from a municipal university to a yeah. state-supported university, and, uh, and all the fun that that brought with it. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's talk about that. But first, uh, who was your um, who was your thesis advisor? Oh, Dr. John thesis? Schultz uh -huh. um, has retired from the university. Uh, and that a wonderful. I, I mean, he was perfect for me. Yeah. It was a wonderful man for me. And your specialty was physical physical chemistry, chemistry mm -hmm. uh, the study of surfaces. I've heard people say that's a, that's the most <laughs> difficult area in chemistry. Well, <laughs> chemists think it is, I think, but <laughs> most most other people think organic chemistry is, <laughs> is the worst. <laughs> but chemists think for physical chemistry. It's just applied, you know, it's applied and applied mathematics, and mm -hmm. lots of people don't 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 don't, don't, yeah. don't like that so well. I guess it's the way to put it. Uh, yeah, uh, the department. When I got here, it was uh, what, five, six members: uh, Dr. Marquardt, Paul, Dr. Stageman, Dr. Lindstromberg, and Dr. Keppel, mm -hmm. uh, and then Dan Sullivan and E.J. Chemnitz, who are still connected with the university, were instructors at that time. Yeah. And so uh, we were on. The they were working on degrees at the medical well, center, if I remember. E.J. Dr. Chemnitz actually uh, finished up his degree down at Lincoln. He commuted mm -hmm. back and forth, and Dan finished his, up his over to Medical Center uh -huh. in Biochemistry. That's yeah. correct. And it took them a, a while. So there was, so really, most of the teaching was done by uh, the four I think I've mentioned and uh, myself. Yeah. Um, so Don Marquardt was the chair. Don was the chair. He was the one that recruited you, I presume. Yes, and uh, yeah, in fact, you know, I mean... What was the recruitment well, process it was, like? <laughs> It's certainly <laughs> different from today's process, I can tell you that. Um, I came up here, probably got here about noon, talked with Dr. Marquardt, probably talked with Paul and Walt, but I don't remember for sure. 
um, probably by three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I don't remember meeting with a dean. I don't remember meeting with anyone else. And now maybe I did, but that's, I mean, it's been a long time enough ago, but I don't remember. I, I went back home, back to Lincoln and, um, Oh, a couple of days later, I got a call and offered me the position, and I, I said, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must have been fairly convenient for you to be that close when you still were working on your uh, dissertation. It, it was, except that by the time I got here, I was into the writing of the thesis. Yeah. So, But still, it was, yes, it's much handier to finish your dissertation and get all that stuff taken care of when you're 60 miles away than when you're 600 miles away. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, it was, that was another factor. By then I knew I was in, my thesis was going down the tubes and that I had work yet to do. So that was another reason. The other reason I came here is that they offered me the job. <laughs> Those were, we were entering a very down period of time for um, hiring uh, for chemists anyhow. I don't know about the other people. Uh, I had students or graduate students that followed me maybe by just two years who waited for four or five years before they could get a position anywhere. Hmm. So it was a it was, I was smart to take the job when it was offered. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, uh, what, what stimulated your interest in physical chemistry rather than some other area? Um, you know, I, I, that's probably a, a question that I'm not really sure I can yeah. answer. It's just, um, I always liked math. I did well in physical chemistry as an undergraduate yeah. student. and. Uh, and as most graduate students do, uh, you know, I talked to the professors at Lincoln about uh, what the research was that they were doing. And when I got to Dr. Schultz, he was taught, he was doing research in an area that I found interesting, mm -hmm. and he was a physical chemist, so I became a yeah. physical chemist. It just kind of uh, yeah. led into it. Um, okay, you came to Omaha in '66, um, and we talked about how you got here. What was your first impression of the campus? What, uh, oh well. It was, it was still a municipal university. Oh, yes, yeah. We were still uh, the chemistry department was housed in what was then called uh, the administration, administration building. building on the fourth floor. Now it's called Arts and Sciences Hall. Right, and uh, but we it were was the original building on campus. The one yes, that was uh, at least right. on this campus. Yes, right. yes. Um, uh, the the campus itself was really beautiful. I thought. Do we remember we had that long expanse of green yes. grass going down from the administration building all the way down to Dodge Street. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there were very few buildings. I mean, our, well, we had the, uh, the administration building, we had the Epley Library, the engineering building, the union, and some Quonset huts. Yeah, the ever-present <laughs> Quonset huts, yes. Oh, and some blue temporaries. Remember how long it yeah. took to get rid of the blue temporaries? A long, long time. Um, so, uh, was what was the chemistry cu uh, curriculum like? Back not, then? you know, not not that much different than it is today, really. Um, gen, you know, a chemistry major would take general chemistry and organic chemistry, uh, a course in analytical chemistry, and a course in uh, inorganic chemistry. And then with the addition of myself, for the first time they offered physical chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, although they had taught physical chemistry, it was taught by uh, Dr. Keppel and Dr. Linsterberg. So this was really the first time that they had had a card carrying physical chemists yeah. to do the to teach the class and uh, uh, so for the most part the course now you know the names of the courses are pretty much the same today as they were then or then as they are today the content of course has changed sure. dramatically but uh, but uh, the course names are pretty much the same uh, the um, now one of the founders of the chemistry department maybe the founder was uh, professor Nell Ward and she had retired I guess a number of years before you arrived on this Yes, scene, uh, from what I've done some looking up of, of, of back into mm -hmm. that period and Dr. Ward my information is came here in 1918 and so I would I would assume that that's what I would consider to be the beginning of the chemistry department yeah. that uh, she was a PhD chemist a female PhD chemist in 1918 that's pretty unusual very unusual very unusual I would um, it's a shame that we've not been able to keep better track of her of her accomplishments and this sort of thing. Uh, she retired from the university in 1955, 
and probably was chair. I know she was chair in 1927 because I have a picture of her and mm -hmm. some students in 1927. So I'm pretty sure she was chair of the department at that time. So that was still when the university was at um, 24th and Pratt or yeah, yeah. that area because they didn't move to this campus until in the 30s sometimes. 38. So, 38, okay. Uh, so, uh, and 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 uh, I and I know she was chair in 50 or well she retired as chair in 55 and Marquardt mm -hmm. Dr. Marquardt became chair in 55 I believe he retired in 77 and I took over the chair so mm -hmm. if we're right about Nell Ward there have only <laughs> we're only on our fourth chair yeah. in the history of the chemistry department well you were chair for more than 20 years that's got to be some kind of record <laughs> well uh, I, <laughs> depends on who you talk to <laughs> well uh, how about, um, let's see, we talked about, you talked about the faculty who were there. Uh, um, all of those are names that, uh, you know, still are remembered here on the campus pretty well. well they were, I, I mean, it was, a, it was a perfect situation for a young, naive mm -hmm. assistant professor to come into. They were, they were very, uh, they, were, they were just, they, they, they took me in. You know, I was 27 years old. They were 50 something years old. You know, they could have just yeah, except for Bob, Bob Keppel. He and I arrived on the scene at the same year, yeah, and yeah. so I got to know him fairly well. An interesting, uh, and a and whole another story. Right. <laughs> and Bob, yeah, he was uh, came to us. He came to UNO from a small school in Michigan, but he came, but he had you know his PhDs from MIT. He, right. had, he had incredible credentials. Yes. Very and he, uh, I remember him telling me a number of times. Well. We're, we're moving west <laughs> and, uh, you know, moved from Michigan to Nebraska and then we're headed towards California. Yeah. That's where I'll he was, end he, up. <laughs> he, he was from, yes, he was from California. Now, he, he, I met once a year, he would tell us that this is my last year, I'm headed, I'm going to California, we're going back to California, but... Uh, yeah. But he unfortunately yeah. suffered an untimely death. Yes. Um, I was yeah, walking on the streets in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, one second or third of July about 20 years ago now mm -hmm. and uh, just died from dro dropped dead on the streets of Lake Geneva from a, probably a stroke or a hemorrhage or something like that yeah it's a really strange situation you know it, it, it just never just walked away from the university and never came back well he helped me with a lot of different things and uh, some research I was doing he showed me some techniques uh, I oh. could use and uh, some other. You know, he was really, uh, really, as you say, a brilliant person. Oh, yes. But he was also, uh, well, and an unusual person. But I, uh, I really enjoyed my, uh, uh, when, my acquaintance uh, with him. Whenever I would get a letter from him, which was not terribly often, it yeah. would always. He always had his stamps. He had such a collection of stamps, not collectible stamps, but all the odd stamps that get put out, he would keep them and he would put them on the envelope and the stamps would tell you pretty much what was inside, what the story was or the message was mm. inside the envelope. He, if he was going to talk, and mine were always about chemistry, so we always had stamps dealing with chemistry or some form of chemistry. <laughs> was, but if you're such a good friend of his, you should have come and helped us clean out his office. <laughs> it was, t took us a year. <laughs> just to, he was a pack rat. Yeah. But, well, I still have some uh, still have a tape that uh, he and his wife made uh, oh, of folk songs mm -hmm. that were historically part oh. of the university and it's uh, oh, yeah. really fascinating. They're yeah. both folk singers. Yes, yeah, he's the, I think considered to be the founding father of the Omaha Folk Song Society. Yeah, and uh, so he picked up some of the historical oh, okay. one, uh, songs that were related to uh, the founding of this uh, oh, darn. Of, uh, Omaha University. Oh, well, which was, uh, I didn't know that. Kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. He, he would not if it he yeah, he was into authenticity. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, you started. We started to talk a little bit about what the uh, space was like up there on the top of uh, the fourth floor of uh, <laughs> uh, the administration building. Uh, was pretty limited, wasn't it? I yeah, we had oh very very limited. We had um, two labs, as I recall, pretty good size, maybe. Yeah, two of those, and then one real small lab, and then another real small lab. But it was so full of storage stuff mm -hmm. that uh, that we can, uh, you know. And I'm talking about the go back to the department. The space was just, uh, you know, it was there. I mean, I I I mean, I'd been in old buildings before. I mean, most uh, my undergraduate was in an old building, so old buildings didn't bother me. And uh, Lincoln's certainly, we were in. My graduate training was in. Um, um, 
Oh, shoot. I've forgotten the name of the... That was before they built that. Yeah, before they built Hamilton Hall. Right? Yeah. Um, and it was old, so I didn't see the oldness of the building being a problem. But it was... We were pretty tight. And, we, and one of, the, of course, one of the good things to that is I couldn't have an office up in the chemistry department. Right. So I had, I had the office down on the third floor, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And those were interesting times. Uh, I shared an office with Bill Pratt from the history Kennedy department, history department yeah. and Tommy Thompson from the history department, and Kay Griesel from English. At that time, she eventually became yeah. a, a counselor, one of the counselors, counselor. and, and some other people from the English department. Um, a black fellow that I don't remember his name or anything, who was always arranging for a sit-in or a <laughs> protest or something. I think us poor, well, that was naive... Well, in the 60s when those yes. things were uh, getting underway. I think way. us chemists sat there and shook in our boots for fear <laughs> <laughs> that this was going to get everybody in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was a, it was a very um, interesting time. I mean, yeah, uh, it's now... It's really hard to believe that you were all crammed into that small space up oh, there. Oh, yeah. I but, remember what that balance room looked like when you were, it was a little tiny oh, cubby hole. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That was the space I used. I was doing some research on uh, that involved brain weights, and uh, uh, that's, Bob helped me. He taught oh, me how to use a, a balance so that I could, I dissected out the brains and then could uh, weigh them, and uh, yeah. he taught me how to do that, and uh, uh, it was kind of, because uh, I'd never worked with an electronic balance before. Yeah. Uh, we, we got those electronic balances I think a year or two before I came, so let's say mm -hmm. 1964, on an NSF grant. So for, as far as I know, it's the first NSF grant that the department ever had gotten. I think we bought about eight of them. They probably cost us about $500 a piece, $4,000, and we were ecstatic. I mean, we were cutting edge with those, <laughs> with those one pan Mettler electronic balances. Yes. Uh, yeah, in fact, I think of all the uh, the only thing that Dr. Marquardt showed me when I came here was those balances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that separated us from all the other universities. We had those balances. But it didn't, uh, didn't take long before you moved out of no, that. No, thanks to the transfer of the university to, uh, to the state, uh, what, 67? So uh, all Wine Hall was built, yeah, 67, Well, yeah, all Wine Hall. It was built was the last building built with money from the right. municipal university. Yeah. And they, um, I think they had started planning for All Wine, but originally All Wine was going to be a three-story building. Mm -hmm. And then, when we when in became when we were passed over to the state, uh, something along the line that this, that OU could not take any of its um, uh, funds mm -hmm. into the state, and so that they had another five or six hundred thousand dollars or whatever it was left or that they needed to spend and so they put fourth fifth floor on all wine hall and that's and chemistry moved into the fourth mm -hmm. and fifth floor an interesting thing we probably planned all wine hall in less than well well less than a year it took us almost uh, five years to plan durham science mm -hmm. center which did I, they let you get involved in the planning yes and i think again that was, in addition to it being the last building built with uh, uh, was uh, city money, so to speak, mm -hmm. with municipal money, it was probably the first building where the faculty who were going to occupy it actually filled the space. Mm -hmm. Now, we were given the outline of the building and where the pillars had to be. Mm -hmm. But after that, after that, we had complete control over yeah. everything else, which was, I'm pretty sure, was the first time we ever had that. From what I have been led to believe, that's the first time that was ever done. Well, in addition to being the last building built with municipal university funds, it was also the last building that was designed by the Latenzer yes, firm, exactly, wasn't it? Yeah. which had designed previously right. designed all the buildings. Yes, the right. Yeah, after. Yeah, Did you, so you worked with le, the well, architects. Not as much as you would like. I say, for the most part, he gave us the outline of the building and where the pillars would be, mm -hmm. where things that we couldn't violate. Oh. And where and, and where the halls were going to uh, be, and after that, and well, you know, and the services, the restrooms, sure, and things sure. like that. But we were pretty free to do, and I'm sure we must have had some meetings. Somebody must have had meetings with the architect. But we, they gave us those things, and we, Bob Keppel and I, went out into the hallway up, up there and, and drew out rooms on the concrete floor with chalk and laid them out and. Uh, did, Bob was responsible for an awful lot of the design of that building. Yeah, uh, he was. I think, I really think Dr. Marquardt may have been on a leave of absence. He went to a, he took a leave of absence or a sabbatical mm -hmm. one time, and Paul was chairman, and I think that's when we, about that time, is when we designed Online Hall. Mm. 
It was a nice experience. It must have been. It, it was, was probably good practice for Durham yeah. Science. Yes. Yeah. Who would ever think that you would you get a chance to design two buildings? Yeah. Let's well, let's go into that for a minute, even though we're maybe skipping ahead because it was only uh, not that many years later. That no, we, we had another new building. Yeah, because we, we moved into All Wine. All Wine was dedicated in the fall of '70, mm -hmm. and I have some notes that we started planning Durham probably in the spring of 80. Mm -hmm. Ten years, yeah. Yeah, I was around for that. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I remember us uh, going to a... Uh, that, that. Uh, where was it? Iowa? Someplace. Over in Iowa to that... that uh, yeah. had a, the architects had yeah. a summer place Mullins, or a retreat Wilson house or something. Birch, and yeah. We went and uh, uh, spent a day there. Uh, mm -hmm. They fed us hamburgers and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and but, that was, but we sat around and did a lot of brainstorming yeah, about yeah. what that building would be like, all of the departments that were mm -hmm. going to yes. be in it. Yeah, and that's the document that I still have, that, that, and that took place, I believe, spring of 80, yeah. which is hard to believe, you know, that only 10 years after we moved into Allwine that we were already starting another building. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that, uh, that was quite a building. Oh, yes. Would you like to guess what Allwine cost? Uh, I should know, but I uh, know I. Uh, you tell me. Well, three and a half million dollars. Three and a half, yeah, million, three and a half million dollars. And Durham, I believe, was around fifteen million. Yes. Uh, someplace in yeah, that neighborhood. It should have been twenty, but uh, yes, <laughs> we yeah. had some people on the board of regents who wanted to hold us down, I think, and uh, well, kept us from. Yeah, and there, and we were still in that time of hassling with, you know, with with. Well, uh, we can't have any research space in it. Yeah, right. Really and your offices, you know, your offices had to be so small and such yeah. size and stuff like that. It was just a lot of, and we did, we, I mean, we gained s some, some space when we moved from Allwine to Durham, but we gave up some things too. For example, in, in Allwine, our labs were all, all of our undergraduate labs were um, 30 by 40, 100 or 1,200 square feet. All of these are a thousand square feet, and you wouldn't think 200 square feet would make much difference, but it sure does. Mm -hmm. Your our, our aisles are real are much smaller, uh, the space between the hoods and stuff like that is smaller. So they're just so we gave up a few things because this was now the state mandated square footage for an right. undergraduate lab, and that's what you had to have. Yeah. But uh, but well, that was an interesting experience planning and building that building. Uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, ha having been in the middle of it myself and settled a few disputes uh, here and there. There were lots of those. <laughs> As you, it's uh, chemistry and physics and uh, geography, geology, and mathematics. Math and, yeah. Uh, of course, at that day. Actually, mathematics and computer yeah, science. Yeah, at that time it was math and computer science. Yeah. And we, we came out just fine. Uh, um, all, I mean, lots of people think all wine is, um, you know, just a box, but it, we like. I mean, everybody who worked in Allwine really liked it. It was mm -hmm. a, it was an extremely durable building. It's the only building on campus with glass plumbing, all glass plumbing. Yeah. You've seen that, um, which has had its moments. Um, and but Durham's Allwine lacks aesthetics, but and Durham has them in in spades, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. But Allwine is a durable building, and and um, Durham is. Um, Built by the lowest bill, bill, bidder, I think is the best way to put well, that. It was, uh, yeah, it's not quite that, but it was that we were, as I said, had our budget reduced from 20 million to 15 oh. million by the Board of Regents. And, and we didn't uh, want to give up the space. And even though a lot of that money came from uh, uh, very generous donations yeah. from uh, Chuck Durham, uh, they uh, didn't feel. You know, I, I think we were being held held back a little bit at that time. But having said all that, it's a yeah. I'm glad to be in Durham. It's a, it was an inter yeah. it's, a, it's a it's a fun building to be in. Yeah, it is a a, a nice building. Yeah. yeah, and it was fun uh, fun working on it. I remember any of the uh, any of, did you get involved in any of the disputes or, or on who got what space or oh. since you were up on the top yeah, floor? So yeah, we, that was we we had very because. Yeah, Why we, did they put chemistry departments on the top floor? Of well, right? some people says that if if we have an explosion, then all we all we do is damage <laughs> the roof. <laughs> but I, but I said that's the answer I've heard. Well, the, but I think more importantly, it's because then your fume hood exhaust system uh -huh. does not have to go up through the whole building. You know, and the longer that, the 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 longer your pipes or your piping is that comes out of those fume hoods, the more drag you're sure. going to have, and all the more problems you're going to have. So I really think. 
it's more a case of it's just easier to vent the building uh, when you're on the top floor. <laughs> but I like the other one. <laughs> right. That's the one you hear most yeah. often, anyhow. Um, well, let's see. Uh, you, your faculty started growing about this time, too. Yes. Uh, let's see. We added Jim Wood before we moved into Allwine. So mm -hmm. Jim came in 68. The building was designed. His office was going to be the glass blowing shop. And so we had to, we had to make changes to that and make it into his office. Uh, and uh, today you can still tell that because there's a door frame <laughs> that doesn't go anywhere in the door. <laughs> but we, we made that, the, the architects made that change for us. Um, then after that, we added an analytical chemist, another analytical chemist, uh, Gary Thurman was mm -hmm. his name, came to us from Arizona. Um, then slowly but surely, we're now up to 11 faculty, full-time faculty. If I remember uh, from talking to you as a dean many years ago, uh, the hardest recruiting that you did was for an analytical chemist. Yeah. Oh yes, one, I can't remember the year, must have been the year yeah, I just I I I hadn't I wasn't prepared for that. But anyhow, someplace in the early '80s, I would guess we we were looking for an analytical chemist. I think we interviewed eight analytical applicants that year. Got turned down by every one of them. Hmm. It, one one whose parents or wife's parents lived in Bellevue. I thought we had that guy wired for sure. He took a job out on Long Island. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, yeah guess, analytical uh, chemists were in big demand, weren't yeah, they? And they still are. Yeah, that's a, if you're a young chemist, that's still the, go into that field and make that's, lots that's, of money. That's the place to be. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, right now, good jobs. Yeah, we, in fact, we just we just recruited another replacement analytical chemist this year. And uh, as I was telling you, we were, we offered it to four different to five people. The fifth one finally took the job. Mm -hmm. So there was one year when you uh, were looking for five, five people, people at one time. Five people five in one year. Yeah. Members, yeah. We got through that. <laughs> I don't think it did my health any good. That's all. And of course, recruiting has gotten, you know, much more intensive uh, in the sense that, you know, when I came here, Dr. Marquardt took a couple of hours off and uh, recruited me. <laughs> now it's a day and a half of very intense yeah. things. Uh, um, and chemists tend to be pretty intense people as a rule, so we believe in grilling them and uh, putting them through their paces and seeing if they can hold up, I guess. And so when you interview 15 or so people in the, during the course of a semester, it chews up a lot of your time, that's for sure. But Can't you hope that we've as gotten a result good you get some good yeah, people. Yeah, we've gotten, we have. Yeah. And we've, the chemistry department, I think, is uh, a very strong department, very strong. Now let's, uh, a lot of credit goes to you for that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it goes more to the people we hired. <laughs> say so, but, uh, well, oh, let me just expand on that for a moment. Uh, the, um, one of the things that I appreciated about your work with the chemistry department and some other department chairman, too, um, was that um, if you told me something, I knew it was true. Well, thank you. And this was, uh, this was especially true when we're talking about uh, recommendations for retaining faculty members, promoting faculty members, and this sort of thing. And this isn't something that I think the general public uh, thinks a whole lot about when they talk, think about university faculty. But uh, recruiting good people is an important task, and then uh, and keeping them is an important task. But also um, being sure that the people that you keep are good people. Uh, that's you know are the kind of people that. Mm -hmm. And you can have good people who may not uh, necessarily fit into the milieu of the department and uh, for that reason aren't, uh, uh, aren't as good as, uh, uh, as you'd like them to be for the overall good of mm -hmm. the department. And uh, We've been that was something that you were especially uh, talented at, I think, Roger. Not lucky, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, I know that I appreciated it. Well, and thank you. I uh, know, uh, well, you served for a good many terms on the Dean's Advisory Committee that gave advice on these sorts of things. So you um, know what I mean when I can say that not <laughs> all department chairs were quite as candid as you were. And, but it was a... Uh, that's something that belongs in uh, some place in the history of the university, so we got it in right Okay. Here. <laughs> um, Let's uh, talk about what other challenges you met as a department chair. Can you think of any offhand? Uh, we talked about designing buildings. We talked about recruiting faculty. What, well, what other sorts of things? 
Oh, I, I, I guess in a way maybe, um, you know, I don't know, I don't consider it a challenge, but uh, the chemistry department's been pretty pleased with our, you know, the involvement we get with our students. Mm -hmm. uh, and the number of students that we've produced that uh, have gone on to graduate school, which uh, mm -hmm. we take as a compliment, you know, that that's, that they're willing to do what, what we think we do, you know. Uh, so there's, so I think, you know, again, I don't consider that to be a challenge. Um, I just well, a lot of your students though, do, go into graduate work, but not in chemistry. They go into professional, well, like of course, medicine. Medi yeah, yeah, certainly, many of them go. To, many go to medical school, but uh, we put one or two into graduate school every mm -hmm. uh, almost every year. Uh, I was just looking at um, the current issue of the Gateway, the, the campus oh, newspaper. Oh, yeah, we, the, and I noticed there's a segment in there on uh, chemistry students who were honored, and there's a long list well, there. We, we're we're quick to give honors and so yeah. you know for for we like to recognize but scholarships our scholarships and recognitions oh, yeah. of Scholars. various sorts and yeah and we yeah we like to recognize those who participate in our undergraduate research program we're mm -hmm. very we're very proud of that yeah and that's another thing you do not have a graduate program no in no here, we do, do not um, which sometimes but you do get your students involved in Yes. Undergraduate oh yes, research. yes, yes. Uh, it's not a requirement, but mm -hmm. uh, we certainly are actively push our those students who show an interest. We're quick to get them involved with a faculty member, and uh, and we've we have quite uh, even uh, even you know now of course now we even have more because we have some faculty with grants and they can afford to pay mm -hmm. their students and stuff like that. Well, so how does a faculty member do research in a department where you don't have a graduate program with? graduate students yeah. who, you know, work well, with you, you in research. You do it, you know, to some extent, uh, they do it in the summer when, the, you mm -hmm. know, when they, the university has been pretty generous with University Committee on Research on funding, giving faculty some salary stipends so that they can afford to work during the summer and not have to teach. Mm -hmm. So they do that then. But we, at least in chemistry, we're, we try and get our students involved and mm -hmm. we, and not just our own. In the summertime, we've had students from not all over the country, but you know, from Iowa, you know, that are students at Iowa State but live in Omaha and they come back and we've had from the Medical Center and from Creighton, so we, we get... Well, this is, would you guess that this is an advantage for undergraduates here that, uh, oh. whereas in some, in universities with active graduate programs, they're the ones who are likely to get the most attention from uh, research projects sure. and so on that they could be involved in, but here, as we involve undergraduates right from... Yeah, well, yeah, it's a definite advantage. I mean, it's an advantage, especially an advantage if they go to graduate school. But even if they just go out and take a job, they, uh, they've had an experience. They've had to do uh, something that didn't have a canned answer, mm -hmm. and they've had to look at results and interpret those results. For, whereas, you know, the usual lab experiment, most everybody knows how it's going to turn out. You know, most lab experiment that we give undergraduates and stuff, I mean, some of them, are a bit more complicated as you get to the higher levels, but most of them are still pretty well defined problems, and they we've worked out all the bugs and things like that. Whereas in a research project, you don't know which way it's going to turn, and yeah. the student has to has to deal with that, and uh, it's a, it's an experience that they can get no other way, as far as I can see. So, um, and all of our students that we send off to graduate school when they come back. Every one of them says, "Boy, I'm glad I had. I'm had that. I'm glad I had that experience. I'm glad I had that undergraduate research experience." And, and we make them, we make them give seminars. So we have undergraduate seminars. And one of the requirements is, if you're going to take undergraduate research, you have to give a departmental seminar. Right. And many of our students give uh, talks at local, you know, at uh, at the Nebraska Academy of Science meetings or at the regional. American Chemical Society meetings, and, and this year we had a student who presented a paper at a national meeting. Mm. And so, they do, you know, they get quite a bit out. They get a lot, a lot out of it, yeah. in terms of what they can write under their vitas if they want to. Now, is the lack of a, I don't mean to dwell on this no. for too long, but is the lack of a, a graduate program in chemistry a, a, a detrimental to the department in the way, in the sense of? making it more difficult to recruit people because they won't have an opportunity to teach higher level classes or they won't have an opportunity to work with graduates. Once, sure, once in a while, but you'd be amazed at the number of chemists who are quite not interested in the hassles mm -hmm. of, a, of, of teaching in a graduate program. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're going to teach in a major program, you've got to raise grant money, you've got to have 
and that takes a lot of your time. So, mm -hmm. so there are a number of students who see their research advisors as graduate students spending all their time writing grants, and they say, this is not what I want to do. I want to do research, but not at that level. Yeah. And so we're able to, that, that's the, that's the... So there are pros and cons there, on both yeah. sides. Oh, yes, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we, I think, within the university suffer because we don't have a graduate program, but sometimes we, sometimes we come out just fine, yeah. too, so... Let's talk a little bit about uh, your teaching experiences here. What, uh, what courses have you taught regularly? With I know physical chemistry. Physical chemistry, and, and then I, I teach in the, what's called in the general chemistry program, mm -hmm. which is uh, just, the, which is, you know, the typical sort of thing. I mean, uh, we, we, we're well enough uh, staffed that we have organic chemists teaching organic chemistry and physical chemistry, chemists take, teaching physical chemistry and analytical chemists teaching analytical chemistry. So, but general chemistry, everybody has to teach. Mm -hmm. And I, I teach at the, in that level and I enjoy it immensely. In fact, this semester, my whole load, all three courses, all lectures, three lectures, were in general chemistry. Well, I, haven't you done some uh, some kind of pedagogical research work some, on, uh, on how you, uh, on methods for teaching? Some, well, more what I've done is um, the development of computerized uh, laboratories for physical mm -hmm. chemistry. That's, uh. that's more. Um, uh, that's the stuff that I've published and is more mm -hmm. on, along those lines. Uh, you know, I got in, I mean, chemist, uh, computers now are so f f infiltrated through mm -hmm. all of chemistry you can't get away from it, but back in the 60s, uh, it was uh, yeah. not quite so common. But I, so I started doing computerized labs as soon as we moved into Durham in 1970. Now so people think of computers as kind of data analysis machines, yeah. but uh, and that, they use them, you actually hook them into yeah. other apparatus to mm -hmm. run the apparatus. Yeah, right. Uh, originally, of course, we started out as a uh, computa you know, as a number cruncher, as right. a data manipulator. But now, now all of our experiments, the students uh, write their own software for. Uh, for connecting the things to the to the instruments, they connect them to the instruments and take their data autom right right into mm -hmm. the computer and all that sort of stuff. And those are the sorts of things that I've been able to present and publish about. Chemistry equipment is getting more and more expensive over the years, <laughs> isn't it? I remember <laughs> wow, understatement. Wow, well, uh, what was it that we bought that years ago that was so horribly expensive? So, uh, spectrophotometer, I think, or something. Uh, well, you could have. You could have also bought. You may have been dean when we bought the NMR. Yeah, the NMR. That's and that right. cost twenty thousand dollars in nineteen. Oh, I think probably we we had it when we moved into All Wine, so we probably bought it in sixty eight or sixty nine, yeah. something like that. Oh well, that would have been before oh, my time. Okay, well that's when we bought that. And that was twenty thousand yeah. dollars in nineteen ninety. We bought another NMR. Yes, and that was one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Yes, <laughs> I remember that. And the other one has probably cost us. Uh, Oh, over the years, the 30 years that we've had, it probably cost us $10,000 to maintain. Mm -hmm. The other one cost us about probably close to four, five thousand dollars a year to maintain. Yeah. And we've been really lucky. Um, we've had, we've had very. We bought a good one. We bought the right one. We've got one that's almost trouble fee, but still cost us quite a bit to maintain it yeah. over the years. Oh yes. Well, I told you about those balances that we bought. Yeah. Uh, Four thousand dollars today won't get you very much in chemistry equipment. <laughs> we could put it into one 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 drawer. <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah. Now uh, we see. We just bought a. We just uh, bought a um, um, a fluorometer. I think that was fifty thousand yeah. dollars or someplace like that. So yeah, equipment. That's you know, and that's why we're to some extent why we've stayed an undergraduate department. That uh, because if you're going to go to the next level and buy equipment at the graduate level, you're, you're talking about two to three times the amount of money. Yes. You know, you, you can't run a graduate department with a $180,000 NMR. You're going to have to have yourself a real one. Uh, one that uh, has a multiple greater probe. degree of accuracy. Sure, and multiple and probes and, right. and all sorts of things and higher field strength. You're just, you know, probably another $100,000. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, so it's not cheap to have a yeah. chemistry department and it's certainly not cheap to have a graduate chemistry department. That's, right. It's a very expensive operation. And uh, How do all these uh, small institutions do it? I mean, how does a 
community college or some, how do they offer right. their general chemistry classes without with so little apparatus in their that's just, laboratories? That's I mean that's that's just it. That's what they offer it with. Uh, it's uh, their labs, for the most part. I mean I don't mean to are 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 just a small step up from a high school lab. Many mm -hmm. times they don't have the equipment, and they don't have the money to put into it. Laboratory ex laboratory education is a Expensive very, very expensive, yes, yes, very expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. Just, just buying chemicals. And of course, today, cost you. This is an analogy. Ten dollars to buy a chemical, and then when you're done with it, costs you twenty dollars to get rid of it. Yes, I remember <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> the, the disposal costs are. Yeah, I remember uh, sometimes Dean talking about uh, disposal of uh, hazardous waste, which sometimes you wondered about how hazardous it was, but you still had to dispose yeah, of it and yeah. dispose of it properly, and that was. And it, that has certainly changed our buying habits. When when I came here in '66, we would make up an order and we would buy a whole year's supply of stuff in one order. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it would cost, but the whole year. And if you know, and we were of the philosophy: well, if we need a gallon of that chemical, we'll buy two gallons just to make mm -hmm. sure we got enough. Well, now if we need a gallon, we buy a half a gallon, and when that's gone, then we buy the next half a gallon because we sure don't want to have to dispose of it. That's right. Yeah, so our, it has certainly changed uh, our buying habits considerably, probably for the better. And we don't we don't keep on hand things we don't need. Um, let's see what uh, we t we've been talking about your teaching a little bit. Uh, what um, is there anything else that we is there anything I missed and uh, we digressed a, a bit here <laughs> and I just want to be sure I didn't miss anything that you wanted to say about it. Well. We could talk about students. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did a little. We talked about students being involved, oh, involved in research, research but I mean, you know, just the general yeah. feeling of students. You know, of course, when when we came in the '60s, we and that was a pretty wild time for yeah. uh, for students. Uh, uh, I think today they work. Uh, it seems to me that they're working outside of the university even more than they used mm -hmm. to. I do think uh, the dorms on campus have been a, a wonderful. Addition to that has to the flavor made of the, a of the noticeable university. Noticeable change. Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, so I, they've diversified this student population significantly. I believe um, most. You know, I, I have more students from small towns in western mm -hmm. Nebraska and stuff like that than we've ever had. That's that's nice. Uh, I do enjoy the haircuts of today. <laughs> 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 the long hair of the 60s and 70s was never my uh, <laughs> never my cup of tea. Um, yeah, so I. I, I, but I still. Well, speaking I, of students, you uh, you know you've been here through periods of change. We were talking about the the 60s. Uh, back in those days, we were a municipal university. You saw when we changed to part of the state system. Did you notice much difference in the uh, student body with that no, change? Not not at that change. I didn't. I didn't. Mm -hmm. But you know, I maybe someone in the registrar's office or yeah. some you know somebody. But as far as I could tell, I didn't see I didn't see any any change. Mm -hmm. I mean most of our students still came from from Omaha and uh, so it was the dorms that oh I think I think the really dorms have had yeah I think the dorms have had the biggest impact on well, we don't call them dorms we call them residence, residence halls right. Right. Mm -hmm. that's right and truly they aren't oh, they aren't they, don't they aren't the it. dorms that's of right. my era that's for sure <laughs> no uh, yeah, interesting um, you um, we, we mentioned a little bit about your uh, uh, some of the work that you've done in uh, promoting teaching of uh, uh, teaching of chemistry, some uh, you talked about designing the mm -hmm. computerized labs for physical chemistry and so on. Uh, I remember that uh, back uh, not too many years ago now, maybe it was it ten or twelve years ago, you uh, took some time off and you went and worked at Argonne National Labs in yeah. Chicago. Is that yes, right? right yes, uh, I was there for the the year of eighty nine, uh, working on a on a research project. Research project um, to um, my my area of specialization, in, at least as a graduate student, was uh, to study what's called the process of adsorption. It's the mm -hmm. attraction of um, well, gaseous, and in this case, water molecules, to the surface of a solid. Mm -hmm. And they were working on a project to um, to um, called um, no. What they were going to do is take all the nuclear waste, and there is a lot of nuclear waste in mm -hmm. the United States, uh, and encapsulate it in glass. They were going to heat this stuff up with molten glass and pour it out into uh, five fifty-five gallon drums, and then bury it in a cave in Yucca Mountain, 
Utah, I think, mm -hmm. or Nevada, Nevada, I believe mm -hmm. it is. And they needed to know when, when they buried this nuclear waste in the in this can in this uh, tunnel in a, in a mountain, they thought that the, at, for the first 150 or 200 years, the temperature in there would be like a thousand degrees because of the, of the radioactivity. Mm -hmm. But eventually, four or five hundred years down the road, it's going to start to cool, and they needed to know if these cylinders were going to hold up to the moisture that would eventually. See, at a thousand degrees, there won't be any moisture in these yeah. in the cave, but eventually there's going to be moisture in there, and they needed to know whether these glass ingots were going to start to disintegrate in a because the half life of the stuff that they're burying, some of its half life is ten thousand years or something mm -hmm. like that. So they had to, this stuff has to maintain its integrity for long longer time. a long time. And so we, they, so Argon was given the contract by the, um, probably the energy, uh, ener uh, energy department to determine this. And so I was, I went there to work on on that project. Mm -hmm. We published a paper out of it. Um, yeah, the, it's the usual way of politics. Um, that whole project's on hold now mm -hmm. uh, because they were supposed to build a, bury the West Coast nuclear waste on the West Coast, Yucca Mountain, Nevada. And the East Coast waste on the East Coast. Well, they continued the funding for the West Coast, but they terminated the funding for the East Coast. Oh. <laughs> well, the people in the West, I assume, didn't care for that either. So now the whole project sort of at a standstill. But it was interesting. It was fun to see in, uh, research at that level quite a bit different. Let's, uh, in the few minutes we have left, and we've got, I don't know, six or seven anyhow. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, the other, well, what we call service activities, I guess, on the campus. And we've mentioned that you served on the Dean's Advisory <laughs> Committee, which to me is the, mo <laughs> the most important service you could do because that helped me as Dean. But, uh, uh, but you did lots of other things, too. You were uh, more recently on the Faculty Senate back in the early 90s. You were vice president of the Senate for a while. <laughs> As I said, <laughs> I think that's a case of rising above your competency. I was really lucky that Julia, uh, um, oh shoot, Julia Curtis, Curtis was president. Uh, yeah, she's in the dramatic arts yes, department. Uh, yes. She did a wonderful job. Uh, yeah. By my my definition, of wonderful job is that she did all your she work. did all the <laughs> she did everything. Right, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I yeah the Senate, and I was on the Senate. Back when Bill Petrowski was president. Oh, the earlier than yeah, back in the... Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah back... And he was president for two 70s, terms. Right. And uh, consecutive terms. And I was on there for both of those. And I was on the, I was on the executive committee yeah. the second year of his term. Very... Those were interesting times. Bill they was... Were. Bill was a... Well, know, he had lots of good ideas. Yeah, he was a gadfly, too. Right. He liked nothing more than the... Than the f this is Professor Bill Petrowski in the history department. History department, there. yeah. At least, yeah. We, ought to, we can't mention that name, though, without well. mentioning that his wife, Shirley, was my secretary for a good many years. It <laughs> yes. was probably the best secretary in the university. I think so. She <laughs> certainly uh, saved right. my, uh, <laughs> my uh, tale a time right. or two, I'll tell you that. Yes, she was, it always amazed me how many um, balls she could keep up in the air at right. one time. <laughs> I just, I couldn't believe. And yeah, she would call me and... Well, you did a, a lot of things as, uh, on, your, on the Senate. You were, uh, uh, if I remember correctly from uh, reading that um, brief uh, biographical sheet you gave me, you were on review committees for at least three vice chancellors. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it means every five years or so, yeah. uh, administrators at the university get a review by the, by the faculty, and the faculty senate gets that job. And, uh, and you, yeah, you, you had that job. Yeah. <laughs> Chaired one of them. I see. Uh -huh. I chaired the, um, I think the one for, um, oh, for Rich Hoover. Yeah, Rich Chancellor I, Hoover, the, 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 the educational and student yeah, services. I was the chair of that one. Sat in. I was a member on, Dr. Bauer, Otto Bauer mm -hmm. as vice chancellor. Um, and one other one that I've. Gary Carico. Oh think. yes, Gary Carico. Vice Chancellor yeah. Carico is the uh, yeah, vice chancellor you. for, um, uh, uh, financial services. Yeah. Business and finance, I guess. Uh, it's um, um, I, th I think that it's must have been a lot of work. It, it is a lot of work, and I'm not sure how much good it really accomplishes. Yeah. To be honest with you, um, but it is a tremendous amount of work, and um, I think we did we did the best job with um, 
with 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 with, with the Rich Hoover one. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we did that one about the best of all. Not because I was chair, just because I think it was a more experienced committee, sure. and uh, we actually I think got some reasonably good data and, and mm -hmm. so forth on his. But um, they well, are. That's a difficult job. It's oh. a hard thing to do. Well, yeah, and you have to. Yeah, you. Yes, it, it is, and uh, and writing that report <laughs> is <laughs> is always a problem. Because mm -hmm. uh, you you know you want to be honest, but you don't want to overstate your case either, right. and, you, and you can overstate your case, I think. Um, well, you must have been good at it, or they wouldn't have asked you after the first time. <laughs> <laughs> that, or they they knew a sucker when they saw one, huh? Um, let's. Uh, Let's see, is there anything else I wanted to talk about as far as your activities? Anything you want to talk about? Oh, about? you were uh, on the review committees for a couple of uh, yeah, I, other universities. Yeah, I, uh, review, I was Nebraska at Kearney. Yeah, I did the review at Kearney and, uh, and at Western, uh, uh, Missouri, Western Missouri State, Western Missouri yeah. State down at uh, St. Joe. Mm -hmm. um, th those are fun. I mean, you get to go visit other departments, and it gives you a good find chance. Find out whether they're doing a what good job doing and tell them how they can improve. or yeah, What yeah. they're doing, or find out what they're doing that can help you. Yeah. Uh, in this case, both of those were um, were um, quite a ways behind uh, UNO yeah. in, in, the, in, in lots of areas, equipment, and, and uh, up to st they were not up to speed at all in disposal. I mean, our, our safety officer here would have had a fit if he'd have seen <laughs> what I saw in those places. Uh, um, but other than that, it's fun. You know, you meet other faculty and you get spend a couple of days with them. You get to so those are useful in lots oh, of different. Oh, those ways. are. Yeah, that's one of the. Yeah, that's one of the reports that I think has an actual purpose. Good well, purpose. we have just a couple minutes left here now, um, and uh, let's talk a little bit about people that you've known over the years. We mentioned. Uh, Don Marquat, I get his first name right. <laughs> <laughs> DN. <laughs> yeah, right. DN Marquat. Well, of course, I think the person that I remember with the greatest fondness is is a is a staff member by the name of George Greer. Do you I remember do you remember that. George yes, Greer? In the in in, he was a storeroom attendant. Storeroom attendant. Right. Uh, just an incredibly wonderful man. Uh, taught me more about life and chemistry than I Wasn't he the man who was related to some famous well, his, opera see, his wife, uh, Leontine Price, yeah, his <laughs> wife was, um, I think, or, well, no, maybe it was Mr. Greer. One of the two of them, uh, she was a, an aunt once or twice yes. removed or something uh -huh. like that. Yes, uh-huh. Now, he was um, he a was man a, of great... I remember him very well, though. man of great dignity yeah. um, had, and came here from Mississippi. And, uh, so Did he did a good job in your story, right? Oh. Yes, <laughs> and a and a good job raising young faculty members. Yes. He, t he he took us under his wing and taught us the ways of the university. Well, I guess we have say. another name now that belongs in the history books, oh. and I think we just got it. Oh, there. I think yes, I think George Greer. Well, that's that. probably a good place to wrap up, and I want to thank you uh, very much for coming in this afternoon. I wish we had another hour because I've enjoyed <laughs> this reminiscing. And to our audience, thank you for joining us today in a visit with Dr. Roger Hoberg, who's professor or associate professor of chemistry and for many years was chairman of that department. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.